recap and a few things. Okay, so last lesson we sort of went through the GPIO uh, interfacing, and of course uh, we again let's quickly just. So we talked about sensors and actuators, okay, IO on your systems and so on, okay. And of course we also moved on to talk about contact bounds. Okay, so there are a wide variety of sensors that you will be dealing with, okay, uh, in the labs, okay, which are starting this week. Okay, so I sent an announcement regarding the lab Sparks Fun kit. Okay, so if you already have a partner that you're going to work with in the lab, then one of you all can go down according to the schedule I gave you to see Mr. Chan uh, from the tech services and he will issue you a Sparks Fun kit. Okay, if you currently do not have a partner to work with, then you wait until you go for your first lab. Okay, then you see who are the others who also don't have a partner yet, and then you team up. Okay? So that is for the kit. So inside the kit, when you get it already, you will see a lot of uh, sensors inside. Of course, you are free to play around and do what you or build some simple circuit. You want to do Arduino programming and try it out also, it's fine. Okay, but in the lab, we're going to be focused on the C programming part, uh, which is like I said, beyond the sketch programming. Okay? So again, these are some of the sensors and A to D conversion. Okay? So towards the end of these slides, like I mentioned, there are supplementary material to give you additional information. Okay? Uh, in case you do not have some of the hardware-related background. Okay? So we also talk about output devices, and we talk about PWM as well. Okay? So this PWM, again, is important. You will see it. Uh, quite frequently, again and again, uh, not only in this module, I'm sure other modules, as long as there is some form of uh, motor movement involved, PWM will come in. Okay, so to know how to do PWM is actually a good thing. Okay, uh, plus at the same time, uh, we went on to the software interfacing part. Okay, so this is, uh, of course, important in terms of your Arduino IO programming. Okay, so if you have not yet uh, explored this, okay, in your first lab you will be doing it. Okay, so later before we end, I will review the first lab manual. Okay, so you roughly understand what is expected of you. Okay, if you work before the lab, your lab will be very easy, very smooth. Okay, if you wait until the lab time and then you start to install everything, you will spend a lot of time just installing stuff. Okay. So later I'll go through the lab manual so you roughly understand the expectation. Okay, so again this is what we went through last week. Okay, so before we go on to this week's lecture, uh, of course last week I forgot to do the Kahoot quiz. Okay, so can we do the quiz before we do the rest of the things? Okay, so let me launch the quiz. Can you all stand by your mobile phones, please?
Okay, so please uh, sign in with your mobile phone. So as promised, the winner will get something. Eh? The winner should get something. Right? Okay, those who just came in faster, sign in with your phone. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so seven questions. Huh? So this question got no marks. Why? Because it is an open-ended question. Okay, so if you recall what is contact bounce. Contact bounce is the additional signals that are generated when you depress a mechanical switch. Correct? Okay, so whether you want to handle that through a hardware uh, solution or a software solution or a mixture of both is up to you. Correct? Uh, depending on what are the resources you have and so on. Okay, so Again, this is a very common issue uh, in your system when you build, you have a keypad, you have a button, as long as you have some mechanical interfaces, okay, there will be always this kind of false triggers that they may generate. Okay, so how you want to handle them, whether through hardware, software, or a mixture is up to you. 
Okay, so this is just open ended to make you think. Uh, so there's no points for this. Okay? Okay, so it comes back to IR sensor. IR sensor itself is based on the light wave bouncing off an object and reflecting back. Okay? So if you have a lot of light, it's going to interfere with your signal. Okay? So that's why even IR sensors don't work so well in bright environment. Okay? The more control the environment lighting is, the better the sensor will perform. Okay, so this is important. That's why sometimes you see some of those robotics composition, they say cannot use flash photography. Why? Because your flash is going to interfere with your sensor. Okay? So if you control the lighting, you get a better performance for your sensors. Okay, depending on the type of sensor. Okay, so rightfully you should not have too much of bright light uh, when you're dealing with bright sensor because you don't want to interfere with the IR signal. Or Kinder Bueno. So it should be quite easy, yeah. Okay, ultrasonic sensors are one of the most fundamental sensors used. Okay, in a lot of environment because sound wave can travel anywhere. Alright? Okay, so underwater, above water, doesn't matter. All you need to do is what? You need to characterize the behavior before using it. Correct? Okay? So when you want to use a sensor, you must know what is the application context. Okay? Then you inside your code, you should know that if I'm using it in an underwater scenario. What is the reflection time? Okay, if it's an open air scenario, what's the reflection time and so on? Okay, but ultrasonic sensors work in both cases because the waves will still travel. Okay. Well, Kinder Bueno is still leading. Okay, so this is slightly tricky, correct? Okay, when you say 50% duty cycle, means what? That means 50% of the time is 1, 50% of the time is 0, correct? But a sine wave, though it's half-half, is it 1 50% of the time? No, it's rising up to 1. It's only 1 for an instance of time. Then it's coming back down to 0, correct? So even though it may look same in terms of cyclic behavior, the actual voltage is not the same, correct? Uh, a PWM duty cycle 50% means 50% is 1, 50% is 0. A sine wave is going up to 1 only for instance, correct? Then it's going back down to 0. Okay? So the effect will be different. And uh, the effect will be different. How can I discuss kind a of question for midterm, can? Can I? Uh? Of course, no lah. Uh, it's not just bluffy only. Eh, hey, where is my Kinder Bono? Okay, so this one also, if you recall the wave, the board, your look at your notes, huh? your Arduino Uno board has headers on the side which they label 0 to 13. Those are your Arduino numbering. It is not your microcontroller numbering. Okay, your microcontroller pin numbering is based on the chip. 
The Arduino numbering is they just randomize the number based on how they want you to program. That's it. So it's too different. Okay, why is this important? Again, if you do sketch programming, yes, you look at Arduino numbering. But in our course, we are not doing sketch programming. We are doing actual microcontroller programming. So you need to know which is the actual microcontroller pin you're talking about. Is it port D? Is it port B? Under port B, what is the pin? Uh, which register and so on. Okay? So you must differentiate this uh, very clearly. Yeah? Okay, direction of port B pins. So this one, well, six six on both sides. Okay, so this one is fairly straightforward. Huh? So there are only three registers involved. Okay, and only one register for direction control, DDRB. Correct. Huh? So this register, DDR is generic term. Correct. DDRB, DDRC, DDRD. Okay, depending on which register you want to update. Okay, so that register pins need to be updated before when you want to decide whether the pin is going to be input or output. Okay, so that's the direction. Okay, so all this is again important. You will do it in the lab. Huh? So if you don't know it now, don't worry. Huh? When it comes to the labs, you have time to practice. Okay, so the last question. Last question. Okay, so again, this one, there are three registers total, correct? DDRB is to set your direction, then there's two other registers, port B and pin B. If you look at your notes, you'll see there are two other registers, port B and pin B. Port B is to write, pin B is to read. Okay, so even though they are the same address, okay, you actually have to code it accessing two different registers depending on whether it's a read or write operation. Okay? So the winner, Ugandan Knuckle, who is that? Hey, who's the winner, Ugandan? Come, come, come. Uh, this is a healthy 10 gram gourmet protein bar for you. Uh, I don't give chocolate, I only give healthy stuff one. Okay, so, okay, again, this Kahoot quiz all is just, you don't just take it for fun, uh, happy, happy, click, 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 no, uh, it's to make you know what you don't know, correct? Uh, it's always important to know what we don't know. If you don't know what we don't know, then it's very scary, correct? We must always know what we don't know. Okay, so now you know what you don't know, so you can go up and, and read up again, correct, before you go for your lab. Okay, so let's come back to our lecture for today. Okay, interrupt and DMA. Okay, so today I have to use my laptop because this thing suddenly not so functioning. So I am unable to use the stylus. I will try my best whether it works. Okay, so today we are going to talk about interrupt and DMA. Okay. Um, again, some of you may have studied this before uh, if you have already studied about microcontrollers. Okay, if you have not, then it's okay. We will just go through the material so you roughly understand how it works. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so we're going to cover three main things. Huh? Polling, interrupt, driven I.O. and DMA. Okay? Uh, again, shouldn't be too long. I think by 5.15, 5.20, we should be done. Okay? So, again, these are three main topics. Okay, so again, whatever we are studying at the lecture slide material is also what you will apply a bit on the lab side as well. Okay, so you will have a hands-on uh, with some of this stuff. Okay, so let's look at this uh, interrupt processing. Okay, so in this interrupt processing,
Sorry, I give me a mail. Okay, so in interrupt, in input processing, okay, so when you connect your processor, okay, when you connect your processor, okay, to a device, okay, when you connect your processor to a device, okay, CPU, okay, so assuming, okay, whether it's a serial port, okay, in this case, so a serial port is what? Okay, when you say data comes in serially, means what? Okay, how many ways can data come in? Serial or parallel, correct? Okay, so in parallel means what? That means you transfer all the bits at the same time, correct? Okay, in serial means you transfer it in a single line or maybe two lines, okay, in a bit stream. Okay, so in a serial communication protocol, you have a single line maybe and you continuously send bit information. Okay, and in this example, what do you see? You see that our serial port from another device or another controller is sending in data at a specific baud rate. Okay, so this baud rate is something that you configure beforehand. Okay, so if you use serial communication protocol between two devices, both of them must sort of agree beforehand what is the data transfer rate. So if my transmitter is saying I want to send at 9,600 bits per second then my receiver side must also be programmed to receive at the same bit rate. Okay, so all this must be sort of configured beforehand. Okay, so in this case, if I say that my bit rate is 9,600 bits per second, which means that the period between two consecutive bytes is 0 0.83 millisecond. Okay, that means after I send one byte of information, I am going to be idling or waiting for 0 0.83 millisecond before the next byte comes in. Correct? Uh, before the next byte comes in. Okay? So, during this 0 0.83 millisecond, I am actually waiting, correct, until the next byte comes in. Okay? So, how do I know when that byte is available? Okay? How do I know? Okay? So, most of these hardware devices, what they will do is they will have some sort of a status register. Okay? What is this status register? This is part of the built-in hardware of the microprocessor. Okay? That means within the microprocessor, your serial pin connected to one of the your serial line is connected to one of the pins on your microcontroller. Okay? And that pin is connected to an internal block. Okay, with all the registers, just like how your I/O registers are. Okay? So once the data comes in, okay, once the data comes in, the register there will get updated to say that the data or new data has arrived on your serial port. Okay? So if I were to write a software, okay, one of the easiest way I can do this is to just keep checking whether this status register has been updated. Okay? So I say, okay, if my status register flag is true, then data is there. Okay? So what will I do? So inside this forever loop, I'm just waiting. If it is true, then I read the data. Okay? If it is not true, then I don't do anything, correct? Okay? So this is a very simple way of sort of dealing with data that is coming in, okay, by doing a polling method. Okay, so if I do this, okay? If assuming that I take 100 nanoseconds to access a device register, okay, the device register is talking about those registers like just now DDRB, port B, pin B. Right? These are all registers within your processor. Okay, so the DDRB, port B, and so on, those are registers for our port direction and reading and writing to the port pin. Similarly, for serial port, they also have their own set of registers. Okay, so all these registers. Assuming to read, to get the status, I take about 100 nanosecond. But I'm actually idling for 0 0.83 millisecond, correct? 
Now, I'm actually waiting for 0 0.83 milliseconds for data to come. But to read that register, I only need 100 nanoseconds. Which means that 99.99% of the time, I'm actually just checking and checking and checking. Correct? Correct? I'm just checking and checking and checking. So, because out of the 8,300 status reads that I will do, only one of it will be true. Correct? Uh, if I look at it, I'm just waiting for the one time that it is true. 99% of the time it's going to be false, correct? Because I'm inside that window waiting for the next byte to come. Okay? So I'm actually wasting a lot of time and resource and energy keep while I'm continuously checking for this status register bit. Okay, so that is the problem here because one thing is a waste of time and energy and the more important thing is while you are waiting, you are actually depriving yourself of doing something else more meaningful. Correct? Uh, so it's not a very good way to do it. Okay? So what are the other better alternatives? Okay? So the good part is almost all microcontrollers, okay, in one way or another, will support interrupts. Okay, so interrupts in general are supported, but the interrupt capability may not be available for all the subsystem in your microcontroller. Okay? So what are these subsystems? Okay, again we are slowly learning one by one. Correct? Last week we learned about I.O. Today we are talking a bit okay, about interrupt driven I.O. Okay, so again you will learn about other interrupts, other peripheral subsystems along the way. Okay, so what is the idea behind interrupt? Okay, interrupt basically means that when somebody is doing something, someone else will come in and say, no, I need the attention now. Alright, very simple. Just like how if in this lecture suddenly you get an important phone call that you have to answer. Alright, what you will do, you will just walk up and you will go out. Alright, because that is considered more important. I need to handle it immediately. Okay, so the same idea here. Okay, so you want to give okay, uh, the ability so that while your processor is already doing something, you still have the option of temporarily putting this on hold while you go and handle something that is more important. Okay, so that's the whole idea behind interrupt. Okay, so let's look at this uh, from a perspective here. Okay, so if I look at it from a PC perspective here, in your CPU, okay, you have all these devices, correct? Okay, if you just look at a laptop or a PC, you have a keyboard, you have a mouse, you have a monitor, and, and so on. But at any point of time, you do not know who is going to use the PC in what way. Correct? Okay, you cannot predict when I'm going to type, when I'm going to use the keyboard, when I'm going to send a print job. It can happen anytime. Okay, so I cannot have a system that continuously keep checking whether this one is triggered, this one is triggered, this one is triggered. But what I need to do is to be able to know that if somebody go and press my keyboard, I must be able to immediately capture the CPU attention to go and handle it. Okay, so I can take the correct response. Okay, so I don't want to go around checking one by one, but when somebody needs my attention, I want to be able to go out there and handle it. Okay, with as minimal delay as possible. Okay, so let's... This buffer all into it. Okay, so let's look at the whole idea behind interrupt. Okay, so the whole concept is when a device is ready to communicate or some new data is available, it must somehow signal the processor. Okay, it must signal the processor that, hey, I want to send some information to you or I want to communicate with you, so I need your attention. Okay, so the device must raise an interrupt request. So it is the responsibility of the device or the peripheral to tell the processor that it wants some attention. Because the processor is busy doing other things now. Okay? In the previous case, when the, you are polling the bus, that means you don't worry about anything else. You just keep on waiting, waiting, waiting for somebody to send you the data. But now you don't want to wait. Correct? You want to be able to carry on doing what you're doing. So when the device wants your attention, it must give you a request. Okay? So when the device gives you a request, then you must be able to know what to do. 
Correct? Because different devices must be handled differently. Correct? Okay? So how do I know what to do? I need to be able to write what is known as a service routine. Or in general, they call it ISR, Interrupt Service Routine. Okay, what is a service routine or ISR? Uh, ISR is a code that you will write okay, to handle that person's particular request. So if I have an interrupt service routine for a switch, then I'll write an ISR for the switch. Okay, if I have an interrupt feature for my serial port, then I'll write an ISR for my serial port. Okay, so this ISR will contain the code that should be executed if this device requests for some attention. Okay, if this device requests for some attention, then this ISR must be executed. But how do I know which ISR or to go to and where is this ISR in the code? Okay, so that is actually through this other table known as an interrupt vector. Okay, so again, don't worry, uh, you will see how everything comes together in a while. But for now, just take it that, okay, your device must first raise an interrupt request. And when the device raises an interrupt request, the CPU or the processor must know where to go to in order to service the request. That means the service routine, the code that you have written. And in order for me to service this code, this information on where the code is written will be stored inside this table called an interrupt vector table. Okay, so these are the three things. Huh? In a while, all this thing will come together. Another form of interrupt is also known as a trap or a software generated interrupt. Okay, so this one is more software driven. That means you intentionally want to trigger an interrupt inside your code. Okay, for some reason. Okay, maybe you want to capture an uh, unhandled exception or something. Okay, so we are not going to traps. Okay, those are software-centric concepts. We are focusing more on ISR. Okay, so before I come to this, let me look at the next slide first. Okay, so in this, what do you see? You see that this is your memory address space. Okay, so your memory address space contains what? Okay, memory address space contains all the code that you're supposed to run. Okay? So in normal program that you write, you know you execute line by line, correct? And you know if I have a function call, what will I do? I will jump to a function, I'll finish the function, and I'll come back, correct? Okay? So that is your normal program execution. Okay, and in your normal program execution, you know exactly that if I am now in line 10 and I call function A, after line 10, I will jump to function A. Correct? I will do this, I will return back to my main code and carry on. Then line 20, I jump to function B. Correct? And then I will do something, then return for function B. So in a sequential behavior, okay, you know what happens line after line. You know, at this point of time, you will call this function, you will do something, you will come back. But, interrupts are not like that. Because you do not know when it's going to happen, correct? Okay, the whole idea of interrupt is you do not know when it's going to happen. When the device says it wants attention, you must be able to give it the attention. So, I cannot have a call to an interrupt service routine. Make sense? I, I cannot have inside my main code, I cannot say... Now, at this point of time, I'll jump to ISR. No, because you do not know when the interrupt will be raised. Okay, you do not know when the information will come in on the serial bus. You do not know when somebody will press the button. Okay, so since you do not know, you cannot think of interrupt service routine as your normal function. Interrupt service routine is just a block of code that will be there. And the objective of that piece of code is to execute those functionality Okay, to handle the event when this device raises the request. Okay, so of course this piece of code is all there inside there, in, in your main memory, but there is no specific call to this function or to the ISR. Okay, that means in no way in your main you will say call the ISR now. No. So who will call it? How will you call it? Okay, so all this is actually handled in the background by the processor. Okay, so again coming back to this, 
when the device raise a request, okay, when the device raise a request, you are telling the processor that now I want some attention. Correct? Okay, and depending on the type of request, that means if the, if the request is through the serial port, then the processor will receive a serial port interrupt request. If the interrupt come in through a GPIO pin, then the processor knows that it is a GPIO interrupt request. Okay, so what must you do beforehand? You must update a vector table. So that vector table is somewhere at the top of your memory range. Okay, and what does this vector table have? It just has the address of where your code is stored. If you look at this vector table, in each of this vector table is only one line, correct? Each of this vector table is only one line. And what is in that one line? That one line does not contain any code. That one line there only contains the starting address of each of the interrupt service routine. Okay, that one line there in the vector table only contains the address of where my interrupt service routine is stored. Okay, so for example, okay, this is a scenario of a car for example, and your airbag, okay, suddenly triggers the GPIO interrupt on your microprocessor. So what must your controller do? Your controller must know that this request is a GPIO interrupt request and you should know that this interrupt request is tied to this vector table entry here. Okay? So when the interrupt come in, when the interrupt come in, the processor will first jump to the vector table. Okay? The processor will jump to the vector table to know where is the entry point. So it will beforehand know that this interrupt came from the airbag ISR, so it will come to this location, and from this location, it will jump to the actual code. Okay, it will jump to the actual code that should be executed for this interrupt. Okay, and once I finish, once I finish, what happened? Once I finish, I go back to whatever I was doing before. So you do not know what was happening before. And you do not know what is going to happen after. Okay, all you know is, at this point of time, the airbag sensor triggered. Okay, so since the airbag sensor triggered, I will stop whatever else I'm doing. Okay, I'll come to the vector table, and for the vector table, I will know that the code is located in this address. So I'll jump to this address, do whatever I need to do, and then I'll go back. Okay, go back to wherever I was carrying on. Okay, before this whole thing happened. Okay, so as far as the main code is concerned, it will just proceed as per normal. If the interrupt come in, the code will stop, jump to the interrupt, service the interrupt, and then come back. Okay, so this concept must be very clear. Some, a lot of you will still have the idea and still have this I question in mind, where do I call the interrupt? You don't call the interrupt. It happens automatically. It only doesn't happen automatically if you mess up your code. Okay? So in your lab, if it doesn't happen, means you have not put in the correct entry in your vector table or you do not do the correct mapping and so on. Then it doesn't happen. Okay, as long as all your mapping, your registers are all correct, this whole process is automatic. Okay? Okay, so again, that is the concept of the vector address. Okay, and another important thing you will also come to that is the priority. Okay, so you also have the ability to assign priority to your interrupt. Correct, because you can have so many devices requesting at the same time. Correct, Not so many devices requesting at the same time. So, for example, in this case, airbag sensor, fuel sensor, clock, and brake. Okay, if all of them trigger at the same time. Okay, then somebody should get the highest priority, correct? Okay, you cannot say, oh sorry, I'm changing the clock display now, can I hold the brake later? Cannot, correct? Uh, you definitely have to put more priority to the brake. Okay, so there is also the concept of priority here. Okay, so you also look at that you know, in your uh, example in the lab. 
Okay, so interrupt handling. Okay, so again, this gives you some idea of what it is. I will look at a few more timelines in a while. Okay, so for example, okay, you are executing some tasks. When your I/O device puts up a request, okay, when your I/O device puts up a request, okay, whatever you are doing will switch to over to a new task, okay. So this new task here happens because your I/O device put in a request, okay. And once your task is done, okay, for example, you're transferring data. Then you can switch back, okay, to your CPU over here. Okay, so this timeline again doesn't give you the full proper idea. Let's look at the next timeline. Okay, so this gives you a better idea to differentiate between polling and interrupt. Okay, so if I look at this, this is your typical function call, and this is your normal function call. That means in your main program, you call a particular function, you do something, you return. And then you carry on. You call another function. You do something, and you return. Okay, this is your normal function call. In interrupt, as you can see, there is no connection between this and this. All right, there is no particular line that you draw from here to your ISR because you do not know when it will happen. Okay, so you cannot predict and say that at some point of time over here I will jump to ISR. No. Okay, so there is no linkage here. There is no linkage here. So while your main loop is running forever and forever and forever, this will happen as and when your device raises a request. Okay, so it's not. So it could also be your ISR never triggered. Okay, your ISR never triggered and you never get executed, which can also be a good thing. Correct. I think nobody wants our airbag sensor to get activated. Correct. Okay. So some cases, if you never get activated, also we are happy. Correct. Okay. But uh, the the ISR will only come in when the particular device or peripheral raises the request. If not, you will never execute. Okay. So of course, there are other design issues for interrupts that we need to consider. Things like synchronous and asynchronous. How do you handle multiple interrupts? Uh, nested interrupts. Okay. So we look at a few of these uh, issues here. Okay, synchronous and asynchronous. So this is also an important concept. Is are interrupts considered synchronous? Okay. So again, this comes to classifying interrupts into two categories. Okay. One are again those that you generate within the processor itself. Okay. Those software exception. What is software exception? When you see the beautiful blue screen on your Windows desktop. Say error checksum at zero x blah 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 blah. That is a software exception. Correct. Okay, which means what? That means while the software was executing, it detects something, so it throws an exception. Exception is another word for interrupt also. Okay, so in some textbooks, exception is sort sort of a superscalar word. Okay, that encompasses interrupts. Okay, so in software-based exceptions, it is synchronous. Why? Because it happened. While you're executing code, okay, then you detect something going wrong, okay. But in majority of the cases, all our interrupts are asynchronous because we are handling requests and uh, devices that are not controlled by the system. Uh, they are all external, okay. So in majority of the cases, most of our interrupts are asynchronous, okay, except for those cases where it is software. Uh, triggered interrupt, then we consider them syn synchronous. Okay, then how do you handle multiple interrupts? Okay, so like in this example, we got airbag. Okay, we have brake. Okay, we have mirrors and so on. So we have a lot of different interrupts. Okay, so to handle multiple interrupts, what you need? Okay, within your microcontroller itself, there may be a priority. Okay. Most microcontrollers already have a built-in priority mechanism. Okay, that means they already classify that. Okay, GPIO interrupt is higher than timer interrupt, maybe. Then timer interrupt is higher than your PWM interrupt, something. Okay, so within the microcontroller, they have their own ranking already. 
Okay, but at the same time, you can also add in a hardware known as a programmable interrupt controller. Okay, when is this useful? This is useful in cases where you have a lot of devices, but you only have maybe one or two interrupt-driven GPIO pin. Okay, just like our Arduino Uno, uh, which you will see in the lab. You have two interrupt-driven I.O. pins, uh, interrupt 0 and interrupt 1. But what if I have 10 different sensors? Okay, 10 different sensors all want to trigger interrupt. Okay, I don't have 10 I.O. pins on my microcontroller. Okay, so one possible solution is I connect this chip in between. And inside this chip, I will go and set the priority for all the different inputs. Okay, depending on who I want to give more preference to. Okay, so again, this priority mechanism that is already built in one in the microcontroller, but if you want more priorities, you want more interrupts, you can add this chip, okay, to add on to your system. Okay, so that is handling multiple interrupts. How about nested interrupt? Okay, so in nested interrupt, what happens? Okay, in nested interrupts, you have the situation where you are executing a program, then the interrupt comes in. And while you are in the interrupt, another interrupt comes in. What do you do? Okay, what do you do? So again, depends on a lot of different possible combinations. Okay, what are the different possible combinations? First possible thing that you need to look at is priority. Correct? Priority. That means if my second interrupt here, is it considered more important than what I'm doing now? Correct? If my second interrupt is considered higher priority, then definitely I need to stop what I'm doing. Correct? But if it is considered equal priority or lower priority, then I no need to do this. Correct? I can put that priority in the queue. Wait for me to finish my one, then I come to yours. Correct? Okay, but if this interrupt Y is considered higher priority than the interrupt X, then I definitely need to do this. That means while I'm in the middle of do handling X, I need to be able to jump to Y and later come back. Okay, so that is priority. Okay, so this nested interrupt again, important thing to note, not all microcontrollers support it. Okay, okay, only those mid range to higher end microcontroller will support this feature. Okay, those entry level microcontrollers most likely do not support nested interrupt. Okay, and even if they support, you still need to make sure you configure all of this correctly to decide what to do in the event of same priority and higher priority and so on. Okay, so this is the situation of nested interrupt. Okay, so coming back to the issue of why we need interrupt. Why do I want interrupt in the first place? What is the main reason why I want to interrupt? Because of? I want to be able to handle somebody's request as quickly as I can. Correct? Okay? Because if I am busy polling, like what I saw in the first few slides, then I don't have time to do a lot of other things. Okay? But if I'm going to poll everybody, then I'm going to waste a lot of time. Because I don't know who is going to trigger me. Correct? So the whole idea behind interrupt is I want to be able to do my normal workload. But at the same time, if there is an urgent request from any peripheral device, I must be able to handle. Okay? So in order to do that, I must make sure that the response time is acceptable. Alright? Okay? So when I press a button, I know that the output must react within a certain time. Okay? So, for example, now, okay, when I press the arrow button to change the slide, okay, the microcontroller here most likely is not pulling for the button. Alright? Okay, on this on this device, the microcontroller is just waiting for a button to be pressed through an interrupt. Alright? So when I press a button, you should know which button has been pressed, and you must know that you must send a signal to go and change the slide. Or do shoot the laser. How much time am I willing to wait? Correct? So that is your response time. 
Okay, and this response time has two parts to it. Okay, one is called your interrupt latency, the other is called your processing time. Okay, interrupt latency means what? The time between when the interrupt is raised and the time when the ISR begins to execute. Okay, so this is important because nothing is instantaneous. Right, nothing is instantaneous. Okay. So you have to always remember that you are executing your program without knowing when the interrupt is going to happen. Correct? Okay? So while you're executing your program and suddenly the interrupt triggers. When the interrupt trigger, what must happen? A few things must happen. Huh? Of course, a lot more details to it, but at the very least, what, what, what have we seen? We have seen that I need to go to the interrupt vector table, correct? From there, fetch the address, and from there, jump to the ISR, correct? Okay, so again, this is just a very simplistic view. Huh? There's still a lot of other background stuff, but you can see that I still need to do a few things before I actually start to execute the code. Correct? Uh, there's a few sort of administrative things that the processor must do before it actually starts to execute the code. Okay? So, with that in mind, we can say that when the interrupt is triggered, there is some latency before the code actually starts to run. Correct? And there is some delay before the code that is supposed to handle the interrupt, which is the service routine, starts to run. That is called the latency. Once the latency is complete, then I start executing my code. Uh, then there is the processing time. Okay? So that is the whole interrupt response time. Huh? That means the latency together with the processing time. And what is important? It is important that the time between interrupts Okay, should not be so long that, that another interrupt can come in. Because if interrupts keep coming in before I can finish processing one interrupt, what will happen? Then I can never finish one interrupt, correct? Okay, I, I, I go into the interrupt service routine before I can finish another interrupt come in. Then before I finish another interrupt comes in. Okay, then what will happen? Then I will end up spending all my time in interrupt, then I have no time for my main code. Okay, so again, the whole idea is this must run most of the time, correct? This must only run once a while, as and when needed. It cannot be the other way around where I stuck in all of this forever and this one never run, correct? And then the whole idea gets jumbled up. Okay, so the response time is critical. Okay. Okay, so let's go for a short break. Uh, I think we can just keep it a short one. Now it's 5.01, let's resume 5.02, huh? let's resume at 5.10. Okay?
this timeline. Oh, that moment. I think this slide goes in the photo. Who's the one? Yeah, this slide. You know, you know where the one button is?
Okay, so. Okay, so let's resume. Okay. Okay, so let's resume. Okay, so let's let's review the, the whole thing again. Huh? So you have your code, okay, your code that is running. Okay, so if this is your main code, okay, consider this your main code. So I know that I will execute line one, line two, line three, line four, and so on. Alright? Okay? So while I'm executing my code, okay, your processor, this code is stored where? This code that you're executing is stored where? Where? Stored where? On Facebook? Ah? Huh? Where? In your memory, correct? Huh? Or Instagram, no. Okay, so this code is stored inside your memory, correct? So, while I'm executing code, what do I mean by executing code? That means, I'm constantly communicating with my memory, correct? When I communicate with memory means, what am I using? What are the buses I'm using? Your two main buses are what? Your address bus and data bus, correct? Uh, that means constantly I'm putting out the address. Okay? Have you all studied computer architecture yet? Yes, no, some, no. CS2100, anybody? Or equivalent? Okay, if you haven't, then next semester look for me. Okay? So CS2100 or its equivalent is where you study computer architecture. So you study what happened inside the processor. Okay? So. When you say you're executing code, means you're going to fetch instruction from memory into your processor and you're executing. When you're executing code, which means what? That means every time I fetch an instruction from memory, I take time to execute. Alright? I take time to execute. How much time it takes depends on the instruction's complexity. Correct? Uh, depends on the complexity of the instruction and how your processor is sort of designed to handle those instructions. Okay, so while I'm executing this code inside your processor, I'm decoding it, I'm executing it through the ALU and all this stuff, okay? So I'm, I'm doing all the processing. In between, somehow, suddenly, pump, there's an interrupt request. Okay, why? Because somebody go and press your switch. Correct? And this switch is actually connected to where? This switch is actually, together with your processor, you have all your peripheral blocks. Peripheral blocks are what? All the subsystem that work together with the processor. Things like what? Okay, so of course the basic thing is what we have studied before last week, GPIO. Correct? Then you will also learn other things. Okay, you will learn things like timer. Okay, you PWM. Like what we saw just now, serial interface. Okay, so all these are subsystems that are part of your processor. Your processor is the core and the brain of the system. All these subsystems come together to create the whole microcontroller for you. So, these subsystems are some internal, but at the same time, some of the features are brought out as pins. So, a switch, for example, can be connected to your microcontroller through a GPIO pin. Okay? So, when I connect my switch to my microcontroller as a GPIO input, for example, I must write some software to go and monitor this, correct? Okay, so of course, the easiest way is you do the polling, correct, which is what we saw initially. But if you do polling means I'm always going to waste time trying to check if the switch is pressed, switch is pressed, switch is pressed, okay, which is very inefficient. So, the alternative is this new method called the interrupt. So, in interrupt, what will I do? I will say that, okay, this switch is connected to a particular pin in my microcontroller. For example, INT0. Okay, INT1. Huh? There's a few, two possibilities in Arduino Uno. So, what must I do? Inside my code, I must go and configure the relationship. 
I must configure a relationship to say that, okay, as far as the controller is concerned, it does not care what is the physical element connected to the GPIO pin. All I need to know is to configure the microcontroller to react accordingly. React means what? That means I must say, look out for something to happen. Alright? That something can be either a positive pulse transition or a negative transition. So I must tell the microcontroller beforehand, this pin is going to be configured as interrupt. Either look for positive edge or negative edge. If you see this thing happen, if you see this thing happen, then you go and execute the interrupt service routine for me. Alright? And where is this interrupt service routine? This interrupt service routine is again somewhere inside my memory. Okay, it's somewhere in my memory. It is not part of my main code that runs in a loop. It's not part of my main code. Okay? But when this switch trigger my interrupt, and my microcontroller know that this interrupt has been triggered, it needs to stop this execution of the main code and it will jump to my interrupt service routine. Wherever it can be, it doesn't matter. Okay? So in order for this jump to occur, okay, I must pre-configure all of this. Right? Pre-configure. Because if you don't pre-configure, means what? That means the microcontroller does not know what to do when this pulse happens. Correct? So I must pre-configure and say, okay, when the pulse happens, you stop whatever you're doing. Correct? Make sure you go and handle the interrupt. Okay? Just like when your girlfriend calls, whatever happens, you must stop whatever you're doing and answer. If not, you have to answer 10 other calls again. Correct? Okay? So you have to make sure that you know your priority. Correct? Okay? So whenever it's priority, you jump. Correct? And you finish the ISR only, then you carry on. Correct? You carry on to where you left off. Okay? So this is the whole idea behind interrupt. Okay? Who can trigger interrupt? A lot of devices can trigger interrupt. Correct? So GPIO is just one example. So you will also look at timer interrupt. Okay? PWM interrupt. Serial port interrupt. So serial port interrupt like just what we saw. That means data is coming in. Okay, data is coming in here through a pin. Correct? So again, I might not know when the data is going to come. I can be busy flashing some LED and suddenly the data come in. Correct? Okay, so I can be busy doing something and suddenly data is coming in uh, on my serial port. So what must I do? Again, I must make sure that I reconfigure and interrupt for this. Okay, and this interrupt was also somewhere in my code. Okay, serial ISR. Okay, so whatever I'm doing, if suddenly this event happen, I must I must stop whatever I'm doing and jump to my ISR. Correct? Finish it and then carry on again. Okay, so you can have a lot of interrupt service routine in your code to handle all the different interrupts that your system is expected to handle. Okay, so how you design it depends again on what are all the subsystems that you need to use and how you want to manage all of it in your code. Okay, but this is a rough idea. Okay, so again, interrupt response time is tied to this because you are anywhere in your main code when the interrupt is triggered. Okay, you could also be servicing one interrupt when another interrupt is triggered. Okay, so there's a lot of possibilities, correct? So your interrupt response time very much depends on the time it takes for you to be able to sort of suspend whatever you're doing, jump to the service routine, do whatever you need to do, and then you need to return back. Okay, so how do I reduce interrupt latency? So one of the important things is your code must be kept to a minimum. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, coming back to this example, just imagine, uh, just imagine, for your serial ISR, if the moment the serial ISR come in, okay, assuming that I'm expecting maybe 
one byte of data to receive. Okay? And after I receive this byte, okay, let's say I must do, okay, the one, maybe I, I one kilobyte, lah, uh, one kilobyte of data. So after I receive the one kilobyte of data, maybe I must do some uh, Fourier transform on the data. You all like Fourier transform, right? You all are maths, maths expert, correct? Okay, after I do Fourier transform, finish, then I must send the data to memory. Okay? So there are three things I need to do, correct? Or two things. Once the data come in, I need to make sure I finish reading one kilobyte of data. After I finish the one kilobyte of data, then I do the Fourier transform. Then after I do the Fourier transform, then I save it to memory. Okay, so imagine I need to do all this thing whenever the serial interrupt is triggered. Okay, so all of this is, and I put all of this inside my ISR code. What will happen? It's going to be a very, very long ISR code. Correct? Okay, it's going to be a very, very long ISR code. And if your ISR code becomes very, very long, what will happen? I will take a very, very long time before I can come back here. Correct? Okay? And that is also dangerous because then you are not able to go back and do what you're supposed to be continuously doing, then all your other interrupts also cannot resume, correct? Okay? So, in order to handle this, your ISR must be kept to a minimum. Now, of course, the question you may ask is, how can I keep it to a minimum? I've got so many things to do. So, what's the solution? You do what you always do, right? Call your friend, hey, can you help me do it? Correct? So what do you do? You only do the bare minimum. Then the rest you expect somebody else to do for you. Correct? Okay? So you say I only take the data and keep, huh? then you all do the rest of the coding for me. Can? Uh, so your friends are all very nice. So they will do the Fourier transform. They will do the save to memory. Correct? Okay? So the same concept. That means inside my Sierra ISR, I only do save the one kilobyte of data. This one and this one, what do I do? I can put it as normal function, correct? Because this Fourier transform and this send to memory is no longer time dependent on the serial buffer, correct? I already captured the data. What? My main concern is always what? When the data comes in, I lose the data. Correct? I'm not able to react in time and I lose the data. That is my concern. If I can capture the one kilobyte of data, then I don't need to worry already. The rest is just processing the data. Okay, so processing the data can be a bit delayed. Capturing the data is a critical part. Okay, so the one kilobyte of data I need to capture, I do that first. Then I put it somewhere safe and the rest of it let somebody else handle later on. Okay, so you must try to minimize your ISR to make sure that you are able to do the critical sections and let the other uh, non-critical parts be handled later on in your code. Okay, so again, uh, another important thing that you also need to consider is priority. Correct. So, again, this there is no clear answer for this huh? because there are so many different possible combinations of priority numbers. Okay, but again, you need to when the system get more and more complex, then you will see that setting priority numbers can make a difference huh? between who gets more importance. Okay, so again, this is the idea behind how to keep code to minimum, like what I said just now. Split your Interrupt processing to handle only the critical things. Uh, the non-critical things do later. Okay, so this is <coughs> what I said just now. <coughs> okay, so the last part of slides. Uh, just another few more minutes only. Uh, less than 10 minutes will be done. Okay, DMA structure. What is DMA? Okay, so the whole idea of DMA is called Direct memory access. Okay, so what is direct memory access for? Huh? The idea is very simple. Huh? Imagine that right now you plug in your hard disk. Correct? You go to your you go to your laptop, you plug in your hard disk, and then you realize that you have two gigabytes of movies you have downloaded from your torrent website, correct? Okay? So what do you do? This two gigabyte of memory you want to send to your friend, correct? You want to transfer everything to your hard disk. And then you say click copy, that's it, your whole computer hang, nothing, you cannot do anything else, alright? You do not want that scenario, but even though you are moving so much of data between your PC and your hard disk, 
you still say that is such a trivial thing, correct? Moving data from place A to place B should be a very trivial thing for a processor. Why must my system hang because of that? Correct? Okay? So in order to do that, okay, uh, what we have in microcontrollers, again, this DMA feature is not in all microcontrollers. Huh? Those low-end, entry-level ones will not have this. Uh, those mid-range and above will have this. Okay? It's where you are, have a DMA controller within the processor. So what does this DMA controller do? All this memory move op operations are done in the background without the CPU getting involved. Okay, are done in the background. That means it's as if you have a separate CPU, uh, in a sense, just to handle memory move for you. Okay, of course you don't need to use it all the time. Right? If it's a small file, you may not trigger it. But if it's a big file, you may trigger it. Okay, so a DMA controller, basically what it does, it, it takes over temporarily the system bus. <coughs> Again, this system bus is your address bus plus your data bus. In order for me to move data around, I must have access to my address bus and data bus. Okay, so normally, okay, your processor and your main memory are doing this by controlling the bus. Now I put in another device there called a DMA controller that can also control the bus. So when I want to use the DMA controller, it will help to take over the bus and do this move for me. Okay, so for example here, from one hard disk to another hard disk. Correct? Okay, you can do it or from my main memory to my I.O. device. Also can, doesn't matter. Okay, as long as my DMA is involved, then my DMA will temporarily take over the bus and do this move for me. So again, it only works if I have a DMA controller inside my controller, my microcontroller chip. Okay, if my microcontroller chip does not have a DMA, then I can't uh, do this any other easier way. Okay? So the whole idea, no need to look at the uh, just look at this, you will know. So the first thing, the whole process, how it works is, your CPU must program the DMA controller. So when you say program the DMA controller, what am I doing? I'm telling the DMA controller that, okay, I need to move I need to move one gigabyte of data from address A to address B. Okay, so when I program the DMA controller, I will tell what is the starting address. Okay, so the starting address of A is maybe 0x, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 3, 3, something like that. Okay, so that is, for example, the starting address of my address A. And then I say how much count. Count is 1 gigabyte of data. Okay. Then I program some other register that is related to the DMA, and then I tell the DMA to start. So when the DMA start, what will it do? It will request to the devices, okay, whichever is the address device at address A and device at address B. Okay, once it gets access, it will do the data transfer. Okay? Once the data transfer is complete, that means everything copied over here it will send a acknowledgement back to the DMA controller that I have completed what you want me to do. And once it finished, my DMA co controller can send an interrupt signal back to my CPU. Why do I need this interrupt? Because when I tell the DMA to do something, I want to know when it finished, correct? Okay? Now the first step is I tell the DMA go and do all this, do all this thing. But at the same time, I want to know once the task is completed. Okay, so once it finish, I say get an interrupt. Okay, so now the important thing is, during this whole process of data transfer, the DMA take over the bus, correct? DMA take over the bus. That means this bus here, which is your address bus and data bus, your DMA is controlling it. Okay, but uh, it's not in the notes, uh, but there are two variations of DMA. Okay, one is called burst mode, The other is called cycle steel mode. Okay? I would encourage you to go and read up on it, find out what it is. 
Okay? You can either find out now, you can find out during two hours in the exam, you can find out two hours in the midterm, up to you. Okay? So burst mode and cycle steel mode are two ways in which your DMA can operate. Okay? So go and find out what that is first. Okay, so again this is just the illustration of what I just explained. Huh? So you can look through that. Okay, now the last part on the Arduino. So in Arduino, again, we have a lot of interrupts. Okay, like I said, the interrupt 0 and interrupt 1 are the ones for the switches that you will be using in your labs. But at the same time, for example, you have all this timer interrupt. You have the serial, that is the serial interrupt that we talked about just now. Okay, so there are a lot of peripheral devices within the microcontroller that can handle interrupt. Okay, and just now remember I said there's an address where the interrupt vector will be stored. That is this address here. This is the address of the interrupt vector table. That means in this address is where I know the address of the routine to be executed. Okay, uh, for whenever an uh, interrupt or this particular interrupt uh, is triggered by the peripheral device. Okay. So, what are the things you need to do in your programming? Again, you need to enable interrupts. Okay? By default, some most microcontrollers do not enable interrupt. Okay? So, if you want to enable, you need to set some register somewhere, some bits to enable interrupt. Then there's a function called attach interrupt. Okay, this attach interrupt is to map the interrupt service routine to the interrupt vector. That means I'm saying that, okay, INT0, if it's triggered, jump to this routine. Timer 0 interrupt is triggered, jump to this routine. That is the attach function. Okay, to create the link between the actual interrupt and the interrupt service routine that is supposed to be activated. Okay, so we have given you some sample code here, okay, that gives you the idea of how it works. So if you see down here, what am I doing? I'm saying that I'm attaching interrupt 0 to this int0 ISR function. This, this is the function here. Okay, and it is tied to the rising edge. That means whenever I detect a rising edge. Okay, so what, when I do this setup, it means what? That means when I detect a rising edge on my INT0 pin, I will jump to this function here. Okay, I'll jump to this function. Okay, so again, inside the loop, there is no call to this. There is no call to ISR. Huh? Your ISR will be triggered when the event happens. What is the event? The rising edge. Again, it will not trigger when something is done wrongly, which is what? Either your hardware, that means you connect the switch wrongly. Correct? Uh, instead of VCC. Uh. So, rising edge. If you recall, rising edge means what? By default, must be what? Must be low, correct? Okay, so. So, by default, this is a low. When I close the switch, it will go high, correct? Okay, so you must be able to know how to connect hardware either way, either rising edge or falling edge. Okay, if I don't put the resistor, if I just connect like that, can I cannot? If I just connect like that without the resistor, that can I cannot? How many seconds? How many seconds? The rest don't know what to do. Can I cannot? The answer lah, can or cannot? Of course can lah. Your wish what? Of course can, but what will happen? Because smoke effect ah. Then slowly the water sprinkler effect. Huh? So uh, you create some nice effect in the lab. Okay, so what will happen? Because you are going to create a short circuit, correct? Okay? So if you create a short circuit means what? Hopefully nothing bad happens ah. Correct? Huh? So to avoid that, of course, you must put a resistor there, correct? Uh, so again, 
When you do your circuit in the lab, if you're not very sure, ask the TA to come and check. Uh, ask the TA to come and check, make sure everything is correct. Okay? Uh, again, breadboarding, all this stuff, uh, we assume you know. Uh, so you should be able to connect component. If you forget what a breadboard looks like, you look at it, you don't know what you're looking at, please raise hand. Uh, ask the TA for help. Okay, don't connect everything there and not everything is short circuit. Okay? So the good part is the UNO does not have a DMA. Like I said, DMA only for mid-range and above microcontroller have. Okay, so the Arduino UNO does not support DMA, which means what? You don't need to program DMA. Correct? So everybody is happy, correct? Okay, so again, that is the bulk of the lecture which is on the I.O. and your DMA. Before you leave, before you leave, okay, so for your lab one, uh, the lab slides are there, okay, we have given you some links to install uh, Arduino software, you should have it, Eclipse IDE software, okay, so all of this, please try to download and install and see how it works. If you can do this lab one at home, even before you come, it's better still. Okay, you can actually do it on your own because without the hardware, you can still make sure you can compile and run everything. Okay, so if you do it beforehand, it's better for you. If not, you spend the two hours trying to fix all your incompatibility, driver issue and things like that. Okay, so if possible, try to download everything and go through the lab before you come. Okay, so we have given you all the instruction Okay, to compile and download all the code. Okay, so... Okay, so for lab one, there is no submission, but you need to demo to the TA. If you do not demo to the TA that your LED is blinking, you do not get your 5%. Okay, it's 5% of your final grade, huh, which makes a big difference. Huh? Okay? So you must demo to your lab TA that your LED is blinking based on the actual microcontroller programming here. Ah, sorry, based on your this programming here. This is the sketch programming, but it's sketch programming on the Eclipse IDE. Okay, it's still sketch programming on the Eclipse IDE. Huh? So you must demonstrate that this thing is working huh, to your lab TA before you leave the lab. Okay? Can? Okay? So, when you go for your lab, please, if you do not know, ask the TA for help. Uh, they should be able to guide you. Please try to install everything before you come. Okay? Thank you. I will see you all in the labs and the tutorials. Uh. Tutorial also start this week. Okay? So, tomorrow, Tuesday, those who register, please come. Uh.